Hello, Brian from Street Snappers here, and welcome to today's video, which is all about using projects to organize your whole approach to street photography and to keep you productive, motivated, and creatively fulfilled. Now, if you've been with the channel from the beginning, which is, uh, I guess, around about a year now, you may remember that I did a video about projects nine or 10 months ago. And that was when I was quite new to YouTube, the audio was a bit muffled, and I didn't really cover all the material that I wanted to cover. So here goes for a totally new video about how projects can energize your street photography. And I've taken the old one down, by the way. So in this video, we're going to explore why we do projects, what do we mean by a project, and where we can get the ideas and inspiration for a project from. We'll then look at the logistics of running a project and the practicalities, and then how we can bring our projects to life with printing, books, zines, exhibitions, and so on. There are two types of street photographer, those who do projects, and those who don't. Some people just prefer the relaxed randomness of street shooting. And I know some very good street photographers who work like this, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with this approach. If it works for you, fine. You go out there, you walk the streets, you see stuff, you shoot it, you go home, job done. But there is another way. And this is the approach, that this other way is the approach of, uh, dare I say it, I'm probably going to upset a few people here now, uh, the serious street photographer, or at least the photographer who wants to be taken more seriously. And by serious, I don't mean good. This is all about intent, about aspiration, goals, ambitions. But let's take it back a level. I meet a lot of people who are fairly new to street photography. I run 60 to 70 street photography workshops a year around the UK and around Europe. And I meet people at all levels from relative beginners to very experienced street photographers. And th there is, uh, there's a common theme, there's a common strand, and a lot of people have not been happy with the results they're getting. And maybe that's why they're coming on a workshop. Some people struggle to find interesting material out there on the streets and that makes them feel a bit unproductive. Maybe they think their pictures look a bit boring, ordinary, uninteresting. Maybe one of these people is you. It could be any one of us. But uh, think about it. How often do you come back from a day on the streets with a card full of images and you look at them and think, well, OK, not very inspiring, not, not really enough keepers? I think it happens to us all in, in varying degrees. But let's have a, a, a closer look at this and explore why we do projects. So you're out there on the streets. If you're anything like me, you'll be using your observational skills, your eye for detail, maybe your sense of humour to identify these moments, these little treasures, these uh, serendipitous gifts that come our way out of the blue. And you, you probably come to the conclusion that they don't present themselves as often as we'd like. Maybe one good keeper every week, one every uh, two weeks, once a month, perhaps. As you can probably see here, the, there's actually very little going on. And, you know, this is a kind of average street on an average British day. Not much going on. And this doesn't trouble me massively. And I reckon it goes with the territory, but I accept that some photographers will all get a bit bored with this and move on from street photography to something else, landscapes perhaps, because they feel nothing is much happening on the streets. But let's just stop there for a minute. Before we go any further, let's do a reality check. What are your expectations? Where are they? Are you hoping to return home from a, a day shoot with a card full of great images? Well, I certainly don't. And if I get one or two keepers from a long day on the streets, then I'm, I think I've done pretty well and I'm happy. So just store that in your mind for the minute. But let's cut to a different scenario. You're out there on the streets and let's say you're working on some themes. You have some projects running through your head. 
now you'll be seeing the streets quite differently and you'll be starting to make your own luck because you know that when you walk out of that door, you know exactly what you're looking for. You're looking for material for your project or projects and you will become much more focused and you'll certainly end the day more fulfilled and probably with more usable images, with more keepers. You'll probably even feel that you've achieved something. So maybe now we're, we're getting somewhere. So projects then can br bring a real uh, sense of focus to your work. And I've always been a big advocate of projects, uh, as you and you'll find out more about that. How however, and there is a big however here. I'll say right now that projects are not the only way. And I said this at the beginning, we can still enjoy a great day on the streets, taking life as it comes, being relaxed about it all, catching those little moments that swing by. And that's all fine too, whatever works for you. So let's dig a little deeper now and have a look at what is a project. Well, it's simply a collection of images on a theme. Collectively, they could perhaps tell a story like uh, this book, The Americans by Robert Frank, which I will come back to. Maybe they have a common aesthetic, which holds, makes them all work together as a, as a strong set. And a good, fairly recent example of this is Nick Turpin's uh, fairly well-known project on the night bus. That was all about a common aesthetic, great body of work. Or maybe they just have a common theme, which could be say, a geographical location or a specific activity. And then we think where a project takes us, well, it could manifest itself as a lovely coffee table book, which needn't be expensive to produce. Uh, it could be something like a zine. And here's a zine that I produced recently. And uh, I'll put a link to these below. I'm selling these There's a limited edition uh, and I got a couple left. So there are some of those for sale. Uh, this one was all about the, this was a project about the, about the Venetian people. Uh, and it's a collection of, I think, 44 images. Great way to bring a project to life. But we'll have a more detailed look about how to bring your project to life shortly. So let's have a look at a couple of projects from well-known photographers, which have become books, although a project doesn't, certainly doesn't need to become a book. Uh, but the first and possibly most famous one we're going to look at is this, The Americans by Robert Frank. Now, Frank set out to document societal differences in 1950s America. And almost incredulously, he shot over 27,000 shots on his journey across America. 27,000 pictures for this project. But he distilled it into this amazing book of around 80 images. And this is a great example of a project and it shows real commitment, real sense of purpose. And this is a big, ambitious project. And this, by the way, is a, a book that every street photographer should own. Let's look at a, something more contemporary and uh, completely different. This is a project called Harrodsburg by Doogie Wallace shot a couple of years ago. And Doogie spent a year or so walking around the outside of that block that is Harrods in London, shooting the wealth, the bling, the outrageousness, the absurdity of it all. And he shot at close quarters with a wide angle lens, always with a flash. And he called this project Harrodsburg. And I'll pop a link to the book below. A great little project. Then here there's something quite different from Mark Cohen, and this is a project called Dark Knees, uh, which he published as a book in 2013. Uh, in Dark Knees, I would say that Cohen shot fairly impulsively to record fragments of the human form. He rarely included faces, and these images gave a sense of isolation or awkwardness or displacement. One thing that's interesting about Cohen, if you're not familiar with him, and I'm sidetracking a little now, is that is how he works. And he rarely shot with the, the camera up to his eye. Uh, he would often shoot at arm's length, not using the viewfinder, just kind of guessing because he knows his camera and his lens so well, he could just guess that the, 
the frame is going to be all, all good. Uh, some people call this the no finder approach, but it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because we do get obsessed with our viewfinders and our, our little screens. So this is a great example of a tight focus body of work that we can call a project. So a project could be made up of six or eight images. It could be 80. It could be 180. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is the kind of common visual glue, a kind of connective tissue that, that holds them all together, that brings it together as a, as a cohesive body at work. So we've looked at what projects are and why we should do them. But where do we get the ideas for a project from? Do they just come out of the blue? Where do we, where do we get our, our thinking from? So if we'll use me as an example, if you like. I, I try to give, I'll try to give you a feel for how I get started on a new project. And quite often the, 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 the idea for a project comes from pictures that I've been, that I've taken previously. I can look through my archive of work. I might go back a year, five years, 10 years, doesn't matter. And I'll come across an image that I've taken and think, oh, that's got, I like that. That's got potential. I could do with more with that. And there is my, it'll spark the idea for a project. There is my idea. Or maybe I'll take some inspiration from somebody else's work. And okay, copying other photographers ideas isn't great and it isn't really on. But taking one little flicker of inspiration is sometimes all you need. And we all do it occasionally. Maybe I'll base my project on something that I'm interested in outside of photography. It could be related to music or sport or something I do on my commute or a particular geographical location. Does it matter if it's been done before? Not really. As long as you do it differently and with your own spin, your own creative interpretation, it's fine. So as soon as I get the sniff of an idea for a project, I'll write it down in my little notebook, my projects book. And then over time, I'll start to add detail. I'll start to develop the idea and just fill in the gaps. And this might take weeks or even months before I've got a, a well-formed concept of what that project is all about. And I think this investment of time up front is a really healthy thing, but it will give because it will give you a, a more clearly formed, more rounded idea of, of what a project can be. So let's have a look at one of my current projects and we'll use this as, as, as a working example of what a project looks like. Soho, where I work in London, is a, a very characterful place. And it's a place that's changed dramatically over the years from being the, the epicenter of the British porn industry in the 60s, 70s and 80s. To something that's now more sterile, more corporate, uh, less characterful. But fragments of the old Soho still exist. And I'm trying to immortalise them in a book. So this project is now in its fourth year. And I, I think I'm probably nearing the end of it. So I'm shooting the people, the street life, the pubs, the clubs, maybe the seedier side of life. So every time I walk through the streets of Soho, I'm conscious of this project. It's in my mind. I'm looking for material for it. But hey, that doesn't mean that I tune out everything else. It doesn't mean I exclude the, the other interesting stuff that's going on around me. And as, as I said before, the, 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 the project non-project thing isn't mutually exclusive. And one approach can, can very happily coexist with the other. So what do we do with projects? OK, let's say we have a project in mind or maybe we're partway through it or maybe we've just finished a project. What do we then do with it? How does it manifest itself? Well, I guess the first point to make here is that you don't necessarily need an outlet for it. This can be all, all for your own enjoyment, your creative fulfillment. It can be an exercise in self-satisfaction, self-indulgence even. But let's come back to your ambitions for your street photography. Where do you want all this to go? If you want to be recognised, and again, I use this phrase cautiously, taken seriously, 
If you want to be taken seriously, then you need to get your work out there. People need to see it. And if you're getting it out there in the form of a project rather than a random collection of unconnected images, the project will have more impact. People will remember it. They'll take note of it. They'll talk about it. And having the project could, could help you gain that recognition that you want. So let's narrow this down to two broad decisions about the output for your project, print or digital. OK, they're not mutually exclusive. Most of us would probably do both in different ways. Uh, but let's start with print, which is the first route that most of us will think about when we're, we're doing a project. It's the, the obvious route. So in its simplest form, your project could come to life as, say, a set of postcards, a set of prints, a set of frame prints. Uh, you could delay, you could uh, display them in, in your house uh, as your own little mini exhibition. You could have them on the walls of your local bar or coffee shop or even in a gallery or just on your dining room wall. You may think that you may think that the exhibitions are only for the pros, but they're not. And if you've got even a small body of you of work that you think might look good displayed somewhere, just start talking to people. Talk to your local coffee shop and suggest that blank wall over there might be look great with your prints on it. Speak to the manager of your shopping arcade. See if you can have a little exhibition there in the middle of the aisle. Open up a dialogue with your local art gallery. These people often say yes, but they won't come to you. You've got to make the running. So you've, you've got to make this first move. Take along some framed samples of what you've got to give them a flavour of the project. At the very worst, they say, no, it's not really for us. OK, nothing lost. There's a fair chance they'll say, yes, we like it. And they'll take it on board and your pictures will be not only on display to a, a wider audience, but you'll probably also have the opportunity to sell them. Let me give you an example of somebody who's been on several workshops with me, who, who does the project thing very, very well. His projects are always nine images long. OK, no more, no less, nine pictures. And in his apartment at home, he's smoothed the walls, he's plastered the walls, he's painted them white. And I think we're talking about his dining room here. And he has his latest project on one wall. And it's always nine pictures. And he has the pictures in big black frames, but this big, pretty big frames with a black outline with uh, a big, deep cream beveled mount. And in the middle is a black and white picture about this big. OK, and he has these arranged on his wall in the perfect square, the perfect cube. Three, three, three. It's all one big square. And here's the thing. It looks great, by the way. Here's the thing. If, if you take one of those pictures off the wall and look at it in isolation, you think, yeah, that's OK. It's not a bad picture. It's all right. But you put it back and look at it in in the context of the project with the other pictures in that series. It suddenly takes on a wow factor. And that's the power of projects. That's a great example of the power of projects. The collection of images is much stronger than the individual image. OK, something to think about. So then we have books. It's very easy and cost effective to produce your own photo book. Needn't be expensive. You don't need a big mainstream publisher. You can self-publish very easily and cheaply using uh, online tools that are readily available, such as blurb.com. And I will put a link below to, to blurb. Uh, here's one I produced uh, relatively cheaply using blurb. Nice coffee table book. It took me a day or two to design using a very simple online drag and drop thing on blurb's website. And it was here in my through my door in 10 days. Uh, I ordered 10 copies, but it could have just as easily been one or a thousand. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Blurb, by the way. And th this is where it can get interesting, because with a company such as Blurb, and I know there are others out there, lots of them, 
with one click of the mouse or a few clicks of the mouse, your book can be on sale. It can have be zapped over from the Blurb website to Amazon and your book can be on sale on Amazon with an ISBN number there for the world to see. Just think about that. A very popular alternative to books is the much cheaper zine. And uh, we talked about this before. Zine is uh, short form for, for magazine. So these are very popular right now and they can cost very little to produce, either in small or large quantities. And this is a great way to bring a project to life. You can sell your zines online or through galleries or photo fairs, bookshops. Uh, it's the ideal way to just do something meaningful with your project. And then we have the digital options and your project could and probably should be shown on your website. You, we should all have a website at some point. I know it may be early days for a, lo for a lot of us, but every photographer should at some point have a website, even if it's a cheap free one and have a section with your uh with your, your, your projects on it. It's a great way to bring them to life. Then we've got Instagram and all the other social media options that, you know, this is, this is all a great way to amplify your project, to get it out there, to give oxygen to it. But it's much better if you're giving that oxygen to a printed project rather than relying on just online methods to, to show it to the world. Uh, but social media certainly will bring your uh, project to a much bigger worldwide audience and it will line up other possibilities too. But one word of caution, please, whatever you do, don't be tempted to trickle out images from your project as you go along. Okay, you've taken some great pictures, you're really proud of them, really happy with them, and you're dying to get them out there. But now isn't the time to do it. Now isn't the time to put them on Instagram. Wait until the project is completed. You don't want people getting bored with your concept and start to think, well, I've seen this stuff before. It'll have much more impact if it's released as the finished product. So looking at how, how projects fit into my own routines, I'm, I'm usually working on five or six projects at any point in time. But here's the thing, it doesn't matter how focused I am on my projects. I will always come across those unexpected moments on the streets that will give me that killer image, that standalone image. But for me, that's the bonus. That's not why I go out shooting. But please, and I said this earlier, I'm not saying that projects are the only way. Maybe there's a middle ground. Sometimes it's just good to relax, to empty your mind, to rely on those little uh, unexpected opportunities that, that you stumble upon. And all this is a, is a really wonderfully relaxing approach to street photography. And I recently met someone uh, again on a workshop who is an ambulance paramedic. And uh, she uses th this more mindful approach of street shooting to, to dissipate the, the stresses of her day job. And OK, she may get fewer keepers this way but she takes enormous satisfaction and health benefits from her street photography. And for her, projects would probably remove that sense of calmness and being in the moment. And surely street photography is something we do for fun. So we have to do what works for us individually. Well, I hope this video was useful. Uh, and I hope that you do get stuck into pro projects. As, as you've probably worked out, I'm a huge fan of projects and they're a big part of my life as a street photographer. And if you can get your head into this similar space, I can guarantee you it is a game changer. It will change the way you look at the streets. It will change your productivity and it will raise your levels of fulfillment as a street photographer. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, a big thank you for everyone who has uh, become a, a pa Patreon of this channel and the link for that is below. Uh, it's enormously helpful in these tough times when there are no workshops happening, although they should be happening again very soon, I hope. Uh, there is lots more to come on street photography. As, you, uh, as I hope you know by now, this channel is 100% street. I don't do gear reviews. 
I don't do unboxings. Uh, I don't run around the streets with a GoPro. Uh, I just talk about street photography and how it can help you. There is lots more to come. I've got an interesting agenda lined up for future videos over the next few months. So please stay tuned. Subscribe if you don't already subscribe. Give me some feedback, leave me some comments, ask me some questions. I read everything. I always get back to you. It's great to engage with you. Uh, so again, a big thank you and I hope to see you next time. Bye for now.